Let's begin by telling you that reports indicate an explosion at the Ikeda military cantonment in Lagos State on Monday. The blast occurred on a farmland within the cantonment premises, sparking concerns among residents. Details surrounding the explosion remain unclear, with no reports of casualties at the time of this report. However, memories of past incidents, including a deadly bomb explosion in 2002 and the recovery of unexploded bombs in 2023, have heightened anxieties in the area. In response, the Nigerian army has moved swiftly to allay fears describing the explosion as a minor incident. In a statement issued by the Director of Public Relations, Major General Onyema Nwachuku, the Army assured residents of their safety. According to the statement, preliminary investigations suggest that the explosion may have been caused by the burning of refuse and other inflammable debris on the farmland. The Army's Engineers Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team has cordoned off the area for a thorough investigation. Despite historical concerns, the Army emphasized that the situation is under control, urging residents not to panic as they also assured them, that's the public, of their safety as investigations into the incident continues. In the meantime, Nigerian Army troops say they have carried out successful operations in Zamfara and Katana states, resulting in the elimination of 11 terrorists and the recovery of significant weaponry. In a statement, the Nigerian army disclosed that troops conducted a targeted raid on the hideout of terrorist leader Hassan Yentogwaye in the local government area of Zamfara, where a fierce gun battle ensued, resulting in the neutralization of three terrorists. Weapons and ammunition caches were seized, dealing a severe blow to the terrorist network in the region. Meanwhile, in Katana, the said troops engaged in intense combat with terrorists across multiple locations in Faskari local government area. According to the army, eight terrorists were eliminated in the fire, fire fight and troops successfully recovered three locally fabricated guns, military uniforms and a substantial quantity of stolen grains. The army said these operations underscored the Nigerian army's commitment to combating terrorism and ensuring the safety and security of citizens across the country. The High Command of the Nigerian military has warned Nigerians not to allow the incidents that occurred in Delta State that led to the killing of 17 soldiers to ever happen again. Director, Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, who gave the warning in Abuja, explained that prior to the incident, the military had constructed several civic projects in Delta State as a sign of goodwill. On the recent rescue of the 16 and 17 hostages in Sokoto and Kaduna states, Buba noted that the rescue operations was based on collaboration between the military working with local authorities and government agencies across the country in a coordinated approach, which he however urged citizens to remember that they are their first line of intelligence. Meanwhile, General Buba said during the last week under review that troops neutralized 212 and arrested 252 persons. They also arrested 29 perpetrators of oil theft and rescued 244 kidnapped hostages. Citizens, you must know that you are our first line of intelligence and therefore must rise to the occasion. We have a duty to flush out the culprits, and we must rise to that occasion. The success demonstrates the unwavering commitment of the armed forces to secure and protect the citizens of this country against harm and acts of terror. Nevertheless, Troops will continue with their efforts until the culprits are found, arrested, tried, and brought to justice by Nigeria. Stakeholders in Nigeria are calling for the death penalty for those caught vandalizing critical national infrastructure. Now this comes amidst growing concerns over the widespread destruction of public property 
from the newly constructed second Niger Bridge to railway tracks and power lines. At a summit convened to address this court of destruction and vandalism of critical national infrastructure, Dr. Peter Afunanya, Director of Public Relations and Strategic Communications at the Department of State Services, issued a rallying cry to Nigerians urging them to stand up and defend the infrastructure provided by the government. He emphasized the importance of citizen cooperation in reporting vital information to the relevant authorities to combat this menace effectively. Additionally, Emmanuel Johnny, president of the Vision One Leadership Development Initiative, echoed the sentiments of many by advocating for the ultimate deterrent, which is the death penalty for guilty vandals. We look at the role of citizens in critical national infrastructure protection. What do you do as a citizen to protect the electric line that has passed through your place, whether there is a, um, power in it or not? Uh, because when we say roles of citizens, or citizens' role in critical national infrastructure, we are simply asking every person to come on board and be a part and parcel of the protection of our nation. Now, if we don't allow our law to work, our system will continue to go down. So we have a system law. Let's allow this law to work. So National Assembly should consider all this legal framework in making sure that, look, if we vandalize government infrastructure, this is a penalty. Then as we are living in the community, look, telecom infrastructure is important because without telecom infrastructure, they can never create knowledge and ICT-based society. Without power infrastructure, you can, your business cannot grow. So why are you not taking responsibility as citizen? See it as your own. Still talking security, the students that were kidnapped by aliens suspected along the east-west road in Ugeli North local government area of Delta State, south-south Nigeria, have regained their freedom from the kidnappers' den. The student's Siena vehicle was hijacked last Friday while returning from Calabar at the Enreni axis of the east-west road. A Delta State Police Public Relations Officer, S.P. Edafe Bright, in a WhatsApp chat with New Central Correspondent Austin Azu, confirmed that the students have been released from captivity. And let's talk politics, where the new Nigeria People's Party, through its board of trustees led by Dr. Temi Tokbe Aluko, have filed a suit before the Federal High Court of Buja to stop the proposed Congress and convention slated for 2nd to 6th of April 2024. The suit was filed with an advanced copy sent to INEC chairman with a covering letter from Barrister Mondi Mawa of Templum Chamber advising the commission not to participate in the legal Congress and convention until the determination of the case in court. Consequently, the Federal High Court of Buja has fixed April 16 for the hearing of the matter before Honorable Justice Obiora Ogwatu and INEC was duly served by the court bailiff on Friday, 28th of March, 2024. The National Publicity Secretary of the Party, Abdul Salam Abdurazak, said that the effective service of the suit before Honorable Justice Ogwatu on INEC on Friday, the 28th of March, is another deputy for Conquasso's group for the third time in a row because INEC, as a neutral and unbiased uh, commission, by its tradition, may decide not to participate in any NNPP's factional congress or convention until all litigations, most especially in congresses and conventions, are put to rest. Thank you for staying with us. Now, in the meantime, the Joint Action Committee on Nonviolence Movement has called for an investigation into the death profile of Kaduna State, including the non-payment of contractual liabilities by the previous administration. The group, in collaboration with 27 other civil society organizations, took to the streets of Kaduna, the state capital, calling on the state government to ensure that the matter is not swept under the carpet. Amadin Ui reports. The protesters took to the streets of Kaduna, located in Nigeria's northwestern region. 
are carrying several placards expressing their displeasure, they say the dead burden of the state is affecting the effective administration of the state. The state received allocation of 10 billion naira from the Federation account for the month of March, out of which 7 billion was deducted to service debt left by the previous administration. The balance of 3 billion is not enough, as you are already aware, for the governor to pay salaries and other financial obligations of the state. They also raised an alarm over the contractual liabilities affecting the payment of salaries, saying this will affect the livelihoods of residents in the state. With a huge debt burden, totaling $587 million, 85 billion naira, and 115 contractual liabilities, thereby making it difficult for the state government to pay salaries and contractors' debt obligations. We are parents. We have children at home. It will be. It will affect our children. It will affect the livelihood completely of a family, because that salary is what all families depend on. Even with the salaries, they they manage. It, it doesn't go anywhere. Not to talk of not even having salary at all. They called for a forensic audit of the state's accounts and other financial transactions by the former government. Investigate the depleted resources of the state treasury. A forensic audit of investigations should be, should be, should be set up to, to, to find out the status of the IGR in the state. That the tax force should be constituted to recover all monies and government assets from the former political appointees and former state house of assembly members and the likes. That anybody found wanting for the investigation should have his assets confiscated and forfeited to the state government. The protesters say several contracts were awarded by the previous administration, for which many of them are believed to be ghost projects. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. Thank you, Amadine, for that report. It is believed that Nigeria is currently facing a daunting socioeconomic condition, one characterized by insurgency and economic recession. Unfortunately, many Lagos residents admit that with the challenging conditions they find themselves, enjoying only a few hours of sleep. Now, health practitioners say sleep deprivation makes the people vulnerable to different health challenges. News Central's Bettina Nweli reports. At times I sleep by 1, 1, 2 o'clock a.m. Because of the stress, the stress on Nigeria itself is enough, not to talk of Lagos. According to Wikipedia Dictionary, sleep is a naturally recurring state of mind and body characterized by altered consciousness, relatively inhibited sensory activity, inhibition of nearly all voluntary muscles, and reduced interactions with surroundings. The effects of not sleeping are numerous. At the least, it can lead to low productivity at work. Unfortunately, according to experts, sleep deprivation, especially when built up for up to 20 hours consistently, may not be fully reversed. Long-term consequences of chronic sleep deprivation or poor sleep patterns may include Increased risk of chronic health conditions such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and hypertension. Mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. You can also have impaired immune functions and increased susceptibility to chronic diseases. There's also reduced quality of life and overall well-being. According to the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, it was discovered in 2016 that 40% of Nigerians have a sleeping problem. One can only imagine what the figures are now. You see, this sleep of a thing is totally out of it. You can't sleep comfortable in your own zone anymore. Just because the stress out there is too much these days. Uh, for me, I don't want to sleep less than six hours in a day. So I think that's the minimum I want to go because I understand the importance of sleep. I don't sleep much because of my job. 
sometimes almost four hours. But if I'm not on duty, I sleep. I sleep no more. By prioritizing healthy sleep habits and making lifestyle adjustments, individuals can improve their sleep patterns and overall sleep quality, leading to a better health and well-being. The relationship between sleep and productivity is a symbiotic one. If you want to be productive, you need to sleep well. Trying to do the opposite leads to significantly low productivity, evidenced in work-related errors, forgetting important details and facts, and ultimately impact a person's creative abilities when they are highly needed. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Unwili. Now still talking health, experts are urgently calling for increased efforts to promote early initiation of breastfeeding as a crucial intervention as Nigeria grapples with alarming rates of childhood stunting. According to a recent report by the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, a staggering 12 million Nigerian children suffer from stunted growth, making the country the second highest contributor to global stunting rates. The United Nations Children's Fund highlights the severity of the crisis, indicating, indicating a national prevalence rate of 32% among children under 5. However, only a small fraction of affected children received the necessary treatment, prompting urgent calls from experts for immediate action. Nutrition and child health experts, including registered dietitian nutritionist Mwabuma Asuzu from the Alex Ikweme Federal University Teaching Hospital, stressed the critical importance of early breastfeeding initiation within the first 30 minutes of breastfeed of birth. Now, they emphasize that exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months, followed by continued breastfeeding until two years of age, is paramount in combating stunted growth. To discuss this, I'm joined by consultant pediatrician, uh, Dr. Ayodele Renner. Hello, doctor. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, so, uh, Doctor, how does early breastfeeding help Nigerian children stay healthy and grow properly? So, early breastfeeding, as we know, is a very important intervention when it comes to child survival. It's actually, as a matter of fact, it's listed as one of the child survival strategies. And why early breastfeeding or early initiation of breastfeeding is important is that there is a higher success rate of exclusive breastfeeding in the first six months of life if breastfeeding is initiated within the first 30 minutes of birth. And this is because when the baby is able to bond with the mother within the first 30 minutes of birth, and breastfeeding can be initiated within that time, the mother is going to produce colostrum, which is the breast milk that is initially produced, that is rich in certain factors and proteins that prevent the child from getting infections. And so if the mother can actually start to breastfeed on time, her success and likelihood of lactating on time and sustaining that lactation is significantly higher. All right, so now why is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continued breastfeeding until two years, why is it crucial for Nigerian children's health? It's particularly important for Nigeria because um, given the present economic situation, alternatives are not readily affordable, and even where they can be purchased, unfortunately, because of the prevalent um, lack of education amongst a lot of our um, parents and caregivers, the safety of the water supply and how well these alternatives are constituted is called to question. And so it has been proven time and time again that the best way of preventing recurrent or repeated infections as far as nutrition is concerned in the first six months of life is breastfeeding exclusively. And the benefits don't just stop at the first six months of life. Actually, children who are exclusively breastfed are protected from diseases like pneumonia, 
meningitis, and ear infections up until the age of five years, especially if the mother can continue breastfeeding up until the child is two years. WHO recommends exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continued breastfeeding for two years and beyond. When I say and beyond, of course, the mothers, you know, raise up their arms in alarm and say, I mean, who is going to do that? But it actually is something that can be done. And um, I mean, this further, I mean, stating it further, the um, our environment, unfortunately, in terms of public sanitation and hygiene is not really where it ought to be. And so one of the interventions in preventing children from acquiring some infections that are environmentally determined, like diarrheal disease, for instance, due to poor water supply and then overcrowding can also cause pneumonia, is exclusive breastfeeding. And so if we can prevent these infections, then cost of healthcare is, you know, saved. And in the first six months of life, a woman who is exclusive breastfeeding is not going to have to spend money buying um, those alternatives Formula. that we can find on the shelves. And that's some money saved to do other things for the family. Okay. All right. But, but then what are the risks of uh, stunted growth among Nigerian children? I really want to also know, you know, uh, the relationship between uh, stunted growth in children and how it affects their ability to fight diseases. Can you explain further? When we refer to stunting, what we mean is that a child has a length or a height that is significantly reduced for the particular age. So if we expect a child to be a certain height or length for their age, and it is less than a certain level, then we say that that child is stunted. And stunting is an indication of chronic malnutrition. This mm. means that the child has not received adequate nutrition for such a long time that their linear growth or you know, their length is significantly affected. Now, one might imagine, well, I mean, it's just the height, so what would be so bad about that? If the height is affected, it most likely means that the child is probably deprived of certain micronutrients like iron, like zinc, like iodine. And these nutrients are very important for cognitive function, learning, mental capacity. And so children who are stunted are less likely to be able to learn and acquire new information and process new information adequately or quickly enough to make it functional in a, in a manner of speaking. The other thing is that when it comes to stunting, because um, if you look at the top five killers of children under five in Nigeria, apart from issues of prematurity and newborn issues, we're talking about pneumonia, diarrheal disease, HIV AIDS, malaria. And when it comes to the ability of a child to fight off infection, the ability of a child's immune system to ward off infection, if a child is stunted, the ability to fight off infection is significantly reduced because they are not likely to have as much protein because mm -hmm. all our immune, our immune systems actually uses, use a lot of protein to fight off um, viral or bacterial infections. And malnutrition has been consistently shown to be an exponential multiplier of morbidity and mortality where it occurs in the child with an infection. A child who is well nourished would be more equipped to fight off relatively mild infections, while a child who is stunted is more likely to be is more likely to be incapable of fighting off infections that might have well, might as otherwise have been relatively on you know um, unharmful. All right. So now, in your expert's opinion, what measures would you suggest on how Nigerian communities and healthcare providers can work together to ensure more children? receive early breastfeeding and adequate nutrition to prevent stunting and also to promote better health outcomes. Great. I think, I think that's the crux of the matter. And when it comes to determining how to solve this impasse, health education is very important. And I think this is what we exactly are already doing. We have to realize that in Nigeria, early initiation of breastfeeding can be challenging because a majority, and some research has actually quoted up to 70%, up to 70% of births in Nigeria actually don't occur in a hospital setting. They occur at home, in maternity centers, in churches, in religious homes, you know, those sorts of things. And so, and not, and it's a minority of, um, births in Nigeria that are attended by skilled birth attendants who have the knowledge of being able to initiate breastfeeding within the first 30 minutes of birth. So health education to educate mothers 
and let them know that, okay, first of all, try to give birth in a health facility. And if for one reason or the other you don't, and you are giving birth as a facility that is regulated maybe by the state government, please let them know that even if the, the health, the worker there does not um give you the give the person the opportunity to initiate breastfeeding at 30 minutes if the mother knows that initiating breastfeeding at 30 minutes is important then she will request for it so health education is very important bolstering primary health care as well i think is critical such that wherever there's a healthcare facility that take deliveries they can actually initiate breastfeeding Letting um, funding funding is very important. Training of healthcare workers to make sure that as they go for home visits post delivery, they educate the mothers on the fact that exclusive breastfeeding is actually very important, is key, and is something that should be practiced. And the fathers as well, of course, have to be involved so that they are aware that they need to support the mothers in every way possible mm. to ensure that the burden of doing the other things in the home is lifted up them so yeah. that they can focus squarely on um, the, the practice of exclusive breastfeeding. Right. Um, I think these are, I mean, some measures that we can actually employ to help to prevent or mitigate the problem of stunting. Of course, the idea of, you know, introducing um, semi-solids at six months is another, you know, entirely um, different ball game altogether mm. in which multi-sectoral collaboration has to come in, in which food security must be improved. The economic lot of the families and of Nigerian families has to improve to make sure that they're able to purchase adequate amounts of nutritious and high value foods to ensure that um, even if they do exclusive breastfeeding, when some solids are introduced, they don't fall back or they don't, um, you know, lapse into stunting in the process of introducing semi solids. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all that. And also speaking to us, uh, giving your expert's opinion on this topic, Dr. Ayodele Rena, we appreciate you for speaking to us on this. Very many thanks for having me on. Now away from Nigeria, several African leaders have arrived in Senegal for the inauguration of President-elect Basiru Diomaye Faye. Faye won last month's delayed elections, securing 54% of the total votes ahead of his main challenger, ruling coalition candidate, Amadou Ba. On Friday, the country's constitutional council confirmed him as the winner of the election. Security has been beefed up around the presidential palace ahead of the swearing-in. Now, about 15 heads of state are expected to attend the event on Tuesday, including the Nigerian president and chair of the heads of state of West African regional bloc, ECOWAS, that's Bola Tinubu. Zambia has successfully negotiated a restructuring agreement with a consortium of private creditors concerning $3 billion of its international bonds. This development marks a significant advancement in the country's prolonged debt restructuring process. Now, the agreement entails consolidating Zambia's three current bonds into two amortizing bonds. Notably, one of these bonds offers increased repayments contingent upon improvements in the nation's economic prospects and its ability to manage its debt obligations effectively. And to further discuss this, I'm joined by an economist and member of CSO Debt Alliance, Emmanuel Zulu. Hello, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for joining me. All right, we'll try to reconnect with Emmanuel. Moving away from that, South Africa former president Jacob Zuma has, has until end of today to appeal the decision by the Independent Electoral Commission to ban him from contesting as the president of his newly formed political party, Mkonto Etsizwe. A week ago, the MK party listed Zuma as their presidential candidate, but according to Section 47 of the Constitution, a candidate cannot be elected to Parliament if they have previously been convicted. The candidate is only allowed to contest or be elected to Parliament or legislation after five years if only the sentence has been completed. However, for the former president, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison and only got to serve two months after being released on a medical parole. The MK party, which was registered as a political party last year, says they are hopeful that the IEC will rule in their favor and come with a different conclusion. The IEC will, on Wednesday next week, publish their final list of presidential candidates.
In the north of the continent, President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi was sworn in Tuesday in front of parliament for his third term in office. According to reports, President Sisi solemnly pledged to uphold the constitution of the country in the premises of new parliaments located east of Cairo. With over a decade in power, President Sisi's re-election with a sweeping 89.6% of the vote solidifies his position as a key figure in Egypt's political landscape. His tenure, marked by pivotal moments, including the ousting of former President Mohamed Morsi, has shaped the nation's trajectory over the years. Notably, President Sisi's new term, spanning six years, is expected to be his last in accordance with constitutional provisions. This transition signals a crucial phase in Egypt's democratic journey with hopes for stability and progress under his leadership. At least half of the population in Gaza face hunger. According to the UN, 2.2 million people in Gaza do not have enough food to eat, with half of the population on the brink of starvation and famine projected to arrive in the north between mid-March and May 2024. There are already reports that children in Gaza are dying from a lack of food and water. Recently, the Gaza Ministry of Health reported that at least 23 children in the northern part of the territory have died from malnutrition and dehydration in recent weeks. Videos captured by the media in recent weeks have shown people scrambling to get food on the rare occasions that aid trucks appear. Israeli authorities have curtailed the amount of aid entering Gaza since October 7th. Meanwhile, the gift of the giver says they're taking efforts to get aid to Gaza. And to further discuss this humanitarian crisis in Gaza, I'm joined by founder of Gift of the Givers, Dr. Imtiaz Suleiman. Hello, Dr. Imtiaz. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Uh, Doctor, if you can actually hear me, what are your team members in Gaza saying about the hunger, you know, that millions are facing there? Can you give us an insight of the situation? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes. My, my team, look, we have an office in Gaza. We've been there since 2013. From day one, when the war started, my teams were very active, purchasing what was available from the stores, from the wholesalers, from the shops, and distributing. But by the second week, they were saying this is a genocide. The amount of bombs falling in, it was difficult for them to get aid delivered to the people. But in recent months, they've been saying the hunger levels are astronomical. You mentioned a little bit about the North. There's three to 400,000 people st 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 stuck in the North. They, they can't move. And only four to five trucks a month are allowed to go to the North, which means four to five trucks for three to 400,000 people. The death toll that we get from hunger and malnutrition are from those that are visible in the camps, in the streets, around where all the people are. We really don't know the number of deaths in those homes in the North. If four to 500,000 people can't access food, there's no water, there's no food, there's no electricity, there's absolutely zero medical services. There's diarrhea, there's infection, which aggravates and puts a greater need for food and nutrition. So we don't know the case. We keep getting calls. Our office keeps getting calls from people desperate for food. Fortunately, about 10 days ago, we managed to purchase something and we got 1,000 food parcels to the north. But I mean, it's 1,000 food parcels for four to 500,000 people. It just it doesn't say hello. The kids you can see and the adults you can see have withered away. There's many skeletons that I found, not my teams directly, but feeding from the feedback from the people inside Gaza, other people who have been to Berlin. I've seen, you've seen kids, they look skeletal with skeletal remains. They've been dying from starvation, no food at all, and dehydration. Old people, those who have chronic diseases, require food to take their medication and to survive. Many of them have died, and that's not also recorded. The other issue that's not covered, and you know, I've seen this, in, in Africa, I've worked in Niger, in Somalia, and other parts of the continent where there's been hunger. What happens when mothers don't have food? Eventually, they don't have breast milk. This hasn't been recorded yet. I don't know if anybody has done any survey. You can't expect anybody to do research now. Everybody's running away from bombs and trying to survive. But there are, there are mothers who don't have breast milk and they can't feed their children. There's hospital workers, 
teachers, ordinary people, all hungry. We get feedback. You know, we haven't eaten for days, we haven't eaten for months, for five months, we're starving. My kids get that, get that, get, get that kind of feedback. Mm. We've managed to take aid in, we've managed to buy aid in, but nothing to the level that's required. So to answer your question, the hunger is at an astronomical level inside the whole of Gaza, but especially in the north, which is virtually cut off from the rest of the country. All right, you, you actually said that, you know, you've uh, managed to, you know, take in food into Gaza and, uh, you know, hunger is quite astronomical there. And as an organization who have actually been at the forefront of this particular conflict, aside all you've tried to do, is there any other plan in place to help with the situation? There's nothing anybody can do. 200 governments in the world can't do anything. What can we as an NGO do? Israel is behaving like a rogue state. It is a rogue state. It is a pariah state. It's a terrorist state. It deliberately targets children, women, the poor, the old, the medical personnel. They destroyed the Al Shifa hospital, a 78 year relic, totally destroyed. And many of the hospital doctors were executed inside the hospital. They don't listen to the, IG, the ICJ. South Africa took the court case to the ICJ. 60 other countries have made submissions. Israel, doesn't listen to that. Hmm. In, in the United Nations, they were defended and supported by the big brother America. All those resolutions were vetoed. Finally, a resolution has been passed that has not been vetoed. But three to four days after that, intense bombing fell all over in Rafa. And in one night, 200 people were killed. So if it was a, a country that's not African or not Middle Eastern, you would have seen how quickly the, middle, the Western powers would have moved for their troops, the armaments, and military into the area to create humanitarian corridors. But since you're in Africa and in the Middle East, you're not human. You, know, you, you don't count, and it doesn't matter. If the United Nations are really serious about their mandate, they can immediately stop this war, send in troops, and open corridors. There's seven road corridors. Why do we need ships? Why do we need airdrops? What an indignified way of sending food. The food falls on the people and it kills them. When they, they run for the food, you know, they are shot at, like dogs, like animals. Mm. A lot of the, of the food fell in the sea. They have to swim, and they drowned in the sea trying to get the food out. Yet there's a corridor that's possible that can put 900 trucks a day into, into Gaza, to seven corridors. Why is that not being opened? Mm. It's quite uh, disheartening and uh, quite sad to hear, but we do hope that, you know, you and your team uh, continue to remain safe even as you try to get aid into Gaza. But thank you so much, uh, Dr. Suleiman, for joining me and speaking on this. Thank you. I appreciate the invite. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving away from that, the president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, has described the disqualification of opposition candidate Maria Corina Machado in the Venezuelan election as an anti democratic coup. Venezuela is preparing for elections marked by political disqualifications and judicial offensive against Maduro's main rival. Several of Machado collaborators were arrested. Señora Maria Corina y otros previamente se les inhabilitó para participar de campañas electorales por autoridades administrativas. En Colombia pasa lo mismo. Aquí, con una especie de doble moral, atacamos lo que hacen allá, porque indudablemente es un golpe. Now to a little bit of business. The Central Bank of Egypt has announced the availability of fixed rate deposits for a six-day period at a rate of 27.75%. The Apex Bank disclosed in a statement that the total amount of these deposits is set at 150 billion Egyptian pounds, with maturity scheduled for April 8, 2024. The CBE utilizes the open market deposit system as a means to manage excess liquidity in the banking sector by offering fixed rate deposits. This initiative allows the CBE to absorb surplus funds from banks and help regulate liquidity in the market. In the world of sports, Nigeria's 2023 Premier Basketball League champions, Reavers Hoopers, 
began their title defense of the Lewis Adam Invitational Basketball Championship with an 80-72 victory over Ghana's Braves of GRA on, um, of, uh, on Monday. Now, three players finished in double figures for Hoopers. Mr. Fawye Banji had 15 points, including four threes. Abel Ophir added 14, while Michael Oriaki scored 13. The Kinsmen shot 14 threes against Braves of Ghana. Next up for Rivers Hoopers is a date with Comets on Tuesday at the National Stadium, Surulere, Lagos. Still talking sports, Adidas has banned football fans from buying German football kits customized with the number 44 after media raised their resemblance to the symbol used by World War II era Nazi SS units. The newly released kit has also caused controversy with its choice of pink for the away colors. The symbolism issue was first raised by historian Michael Koning, who said the design of the kits was very questionable. The SS rune was des designed in 1929 for use by the Nazi units. Members of the SS ranged from Gestapo agents to concentration camp guards. Adidas spokesman Oliver Brogan denied that the kit's resemblance to the Nazi symbols was intentional. They added that an alternative design for the number four would be developed. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our top stories. We told you that Nigerian army has assured public of their safety following Lagos cantonment explosion scare. We also told you that African leaders arrive ahead of Senegal president-elect spies swearing in. We also told you that Egyptian President Al-Sisi has been sworn in for third term. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do you follow us on social media? We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.